Welcome to today's program with Apostle Patrick Moraithi as he takes us on a journey through his book called to serve the spirit of sacrificial servanthood. Wow, praise the Lord and uh, welcome to this telecast. It has been a blessing, a journey of almost 11 weeks talking to you about money matters. It has been amazing. The testimonies I've received of what the Lord has done, um, the financial miracles that the Lord has performed, and uh, not just the miracle, the, not the miracles of finances, but also the knowledge that the, the people have received through my teaching and uh, through the book, Money Matters, it has been tremendous. And the Lord bless you so much. If you miss an opportunity to hear, you can still call us on the numbers on the screen and uh, order for an audio of every chapter. And also you can call us and get the book, Money Matters. It will change your life, it will transform your thinking about money. You'll get to know that finances in the hands of a believer are spiritual. Now, again, as I told you the other time, I have done a couple of books. Uh, last time I talked about Called to Serve. This is a very special book. It is Called to Serve, The Spirit of Sacrificial Servanthood. When I wrote this book, I had taught in a number of places and shared about the power of service, the blessings of service. And uh, every place I went after teaching, people would say, have you written that book? Is it, can I get a book? And uh, out of the demand of people, I wrote this book. Back in 2009, this book has transformed people's life. And especially those people who love serving the Lord. And especially those people who have served the Lord and they look back and they wonder, is there anything good that will come out of service? Now, in this simple small book, I have given just seven chapters. And just to appetize you, chapter one is the call to serve. How do you know you are called to serve the Lord? And by the way, you'll be amazed that when I talk about the call to serve, don't just see the pulpit. See beyond the pulpit. Yes, pulpit, but more than that. Do you know that you too are a woman of God, a man of God, not just because you stand on the pulpit in a coral, in a suit and all that, but even if you come to clean the seat, you are a servant of God. Even if your work is to be a watchman, like David said, I would rather be a watchman in the house of the Lord, even that, you are a servant of God. Then number two, I've talked about, I mean, chapter two is about developing an attitude of unworthiness in the serving. Many people have served God, but to some extent. And then after that, they no longer serve him. You ask him, they say, you know, I did this. I never got a blessing. Nobody recognized. Nobody paid me for that. And I say, the reason why you have a problem is because you are a worthy servant. If you want to enjoy the blessings of God in serving, you must develop what we call an attitude of unworthiness, where you say, it is not me, it is the Lord. It is not because of me, but because of the Lord. Chapter 3, I've talked about the divine blessing of an unworthy servant. Once you know, once you develop this unworthiness in your service, the blessings you get are really divine. People may not pay you, but God pays. People may not remember you, but God will remember your service. Now, but for chapter 4, I've talked about qualities of a servant. How can you tell you are a servant? Yeah, I know you may be asked, how do I know? I will be sharing with you about the qualities of a servant, and you will check against what you think you have, and you can tell me whether you are a servant or not. Then, I've talked about conquering fear. Some of the people who have never served is because they fear. Fear of what people say, fear of what will happen, what if I don't succeed, what if the devil attacks me, all these things. I've talked about how you can conquer fear. Then, uh, chapter 6 is about the promise in serving. Is there any promise? Is there any hope? Is there anything? Is there any expectation? The promise in serving. And then, chapter 7, I'll talk about the language of a servant. Every servant needs to have the language of a servant. And uh, that is um, just an overview 
of what you know I'll be sharing in the next probably 10 weeks about this new book called To Serve. It is new to you because you have never read it, although it is probably older to me because I'm the one who wrote it and I have taught it for a long, for a long time. Now, um, as I think about servants, um, I'm, remind, I'm reminded of when we were in Bible school a uh, couple of weeks ago, and um, we were talking about the, our aspiration. What do you want to become? Why are you in Bible school? And I noted there are those who are in Bible school because their parents have sent them in Bible school. There are those who are there because they didn't want to know the Bible. But amazing, there are those who are there because they needed a CV to ask for a job. And uh, every, every, you know, every reason was acceptable. Now, today, we have so many people who have CVs, you know. They have a uh, curriculum vitae. They are set, you know. What did you get? I have first class honors in Bible school, uh, theology, and all that. But are they servants? Did uh, Bible school produce a servant? Or did Bible school develop, um, you know, produce a... Just somebody with the credentials. Um, if you want to serve the Lord, if you have a call to serve, I, I, I mean, I will share about all this. But listen, um, in a couple, I mean, for a long time, um, I remember talking to one of my brothers, you know, preaching to him about salvation, and uh, he never got saved. And after some time, I found he had given his life to Jesus. And then I asked him, tell me why you got saved this time around. And he never used to get saved before. And guess what he told me? He said, all the time you preached to me, you never gave me a strong reason as to why I should get saved. So I asked him, so what reason did you get better than I want the one I gave? He said, the one who preached to me said, you don't just get saved to go to heaven but you also get saved to serve. Because I thought it would be too boring to get saved and wait for Jesus to come. But when I was given a reason that I could be serving him as we wait for him to come, I gave my life to Jesus. And let me tell you, if you are born again and you are not serving the Lord, believe me, salvation can be too boring. You know, even Jesus said, do business until I come. What was he saying? He said, serve me, you know, do something for me. Life can be so boring if you're doing nothing. Life can be so boring in church if you just come sit down, clap for the preacher, and give an offering, and sometimes don't give, then go away. Then wait for Jesus. It may take long. Get something to do in the house of God. Get something to do in the kingdom of God. And life will not be boring. All right? So, go to serve. Exodus chapter 8, verse number 1. The New King James Version, the Bible says, <clears throat> And the Lord spoke to Moses and said, Go to Pharaoh, and he said to him, Thus says the Lord, Let my people go that they may serve me. Let my people go that they may serve me. Now, I want you to envision what the children of God, I mean of God are going through, the Israelites. The Bible says, of course, after the death of um, Joseph, another pharaoh who never knew Joseph came in power. And of course, he tortured them, he had labor and all that. Then God saw all what they were going through. And he was moved, and the, their cry went to God. And the Lord spoke to Moses and says, The cry of my people has come to me. Now go to Pharaoh and tell him to let them go. Not just because for them to feel they are free. Mm -mm. Not for them to feel they are out of danger. No. God gave a reason. Let them go that they may serve me. So God is interested in setting his people free so that they may serve him. And uh, as I even talk about the call of service, I would want to, want to say to somebody that God does not call an idle person. Actually, even Moses was taking care of his father's, you know, his in-law's uh, sheep when the Lord called him. Not even George Moses. Look at Elisha. He was basically farming. And, you know, he had uh, oxen and uh, he was farming. Um, look at Peter. Peter was fishing. John, the same. The, you know, 
Um, look at Matthew. Matthew was busy collecting tax. Some people are so idle, and when you ask them, you say they are waiting for God to call them. God will not call you. Get something to do. God works with the people who are doing something. Actually, I will also conquer with a friend of mine who said, if you want something done, give it to a busy person. But those people who say they have nothing to do, I'm just waiting on the Lord to give me a direction, those people may never do much for the Lord. So the first thing I want to say is that uh, if the Lord will call us, then don't just wait. Keep doing something. Some of us will discover your calling as you serve. Some of us will discover that the Lord has called you into ministry as you love people and serve them, you know? So do something. Now, um, the first thing I also want you to know that God does not call us to feel nice. You know, I've seen people who argue, you know, I'm a man of God, I can't do this. I'm a man of God, I cannot do this. Yes, and I tell them, I'm a man of God. I can clean the benches. I'm a man of God. I can make you comfortable. But let me tell you, that is, that is, the call of God is into different direction. Now, the first reason why God calls us is to serve him. He said, let my people go that they may serve me. It is amazing to see the reason God wanted to free his people. You know, one might have thought that God was setting his people free just because they were in trouble. But the Bible tells us he was setting them free so that they may serve him. Um, every Christian has been set free by the blood of Jesus. And therefore, he or she, she is expecting to serve the Lord. God did not expect his children to serve him when they were in bondage. He did, I mean, he and to set them free. The apostle Paul says, we are soldiers of the Lord. Now, what I'm explaining in this book is this. The call of God, the Lord blessing you, the Lord opening a door for you, the Lord giving you a job, the Lord give, you know, healing you, the Lord giving you money, is for so reason that you may serve him. Now, God set these people free and he say, now go serve me. Now, any blessing that you receive from the Lord should make you a better servant. If God blesses you with a car, let that car make you a better servant. You must actually arrive for meetings earlier than when you are using matatu or you are walking. In other words, everything God gives to you must make you a better servant. If God gives you money, use that money to expand the kingdom of God. And I tell people, I know the debate always in this world, but I tell you, I'm one person who believes that everything God has given me is to expand the kingdom of God. I, I don't know, you know, somebody said, you know, um, you know, you have money is because you are in TV. And I say, listen, some months have gone without paying this telecast, you know, and sometimes I have to work extra, look for money and they pay. People may not listen and they pay. Actually, many people call me to tell me how blessed they are, but not one who has called me to say, I want to pay this month. But you know, I, I feel good to spend my money and to hear somebody say, by your teaching, my life was changed. To me, that is a blessing. In other words, God has given me this money, this voice, this book, this ability to write so that I can be a servant in his house. So God... The call to serve, you must know that God will start somewhere. But also you must know that you have something that God wants to use. It could be a rod, like Moses. It could be a job bone. Whatever you have, the Lord is willing to start there. Now, I have just mentioned that um, Paul says, Apostle Paul says that we are in the army. Now, when you look at the army, for example, the Kenyan army, I, I remember one of my friends who was invited to the army, and uh, when he passed the interview, it was given the letter. Man, he went around showing people, you know, I'm in the army, and walking like a soldier. And uh, we really loved, you know, uh, congratulated him, and whenever we saw him, you know, he was teasing us, you know, the one you are seeing is an army officer. My friend, that guy had not become a soldier yet. He gave me the story of when he went, you know, that uh, he was even taught how to march. Can you imagine? 
You have been walking all this time, and then somebody is there with you for almost two weeks or more, teaching you how to walk. Which leg should go with what? Then he was even taught how not to be a severian. Now, when we talk about uh, serving the Lord and being in the army, we must know something. One, we must accept the Lord, allow the Lord to train us. No servant can serve the master without getting to know the wishes and the, what the, the expectations of his master. So in the con to serve, we must go through the process. We must allow the Lord to take us through this process. Now, as I grew, I also, as I grew up, I really dreamt that one day I'll be a soldier. You know, you cannot talk about servanthood without mentioning a soldier. But unfortunately, <laughs> I never became. But many years later, I met with a friend of mine. And uh, we were just talking, and I asked him, tell me, my friend, is it true that uh, people in the army have to take bangi when they are going for drills and all that? He laughed. He said, listen, you know me. All the years we have lived with you, we were in the same school with you. I have never smoked, not even bangi, not even drug. I have never smoked even cigarette. And I said, but how are you able to handle the crowd and all that, the aggression? He said, listen, my friend, it's because we love what we do. And I was so changed that all what you see them doing is not just because they are under influence, serious ones, it's because they love what they do. Now, the call to love the Lord, uh, we, we must understand that it is start somewhere. Number one, it is start with us accepting the voice of God. Number two, understanding that God has blessed us with every good blessing for us to serve him. Now, um, if you have to be a good servant, just a small ending I put in this book, becoming a true servant. And how? Servanthood is complex. It demands that you go all the way in obedience to the word of God. The first place to begin as a servant is obedience to the voice of God. You know, God may not speak in a loudspeaker, but in those small things that the Lord tells you to do, Sometimes the Lord waking you up to pray. You know, sometimes the Lord giving you an assignment. Go pray for someone who is unwell. Sometimes the Lord saying, come early in church and clean the benches. Sometimes even the Lord telling you, you know what, go and clean the toilet. You know, I have taken some people through this kind of training. People who have worked with me know that um, I have to test you. I have to take you through some training. And one of the training I love is when you give someone respect a bigger, so to say, uh, you know, a push, a nice position, you take him to the lowest. Because even our Lord Jesus said, if you want to be great of these people, you must be the servant of all. And I want to make that person down there, to put him down there, so that I can see the servanthood in him. Before God gives you, you know, um, a great assignment, he has to give you some despised assignment. Before a trainee soldier is given a gun, he has to do a number of drills, you know, and sometimes not with a real gun. Until now, you are the, the civilian mentality is dealt with. Then the Lord starts trusting you. Now, a soldier, I mean, um, a servant, has to go through this kind of training. Some people, you know, don't survive. You know, they go all the way. The training becomes so hard, they come out. Now, I like telling people, if it is hard to train as a policeman, if it is hard to train in maybe, you know, national youth service, if it is difficult to train in the army and the, the air force and everything, why then do you think it should be easy to train to be a servant of God? A soldier is trained to protect or to serve his country. A servant of God is trained to serve the kingdom, which is bigger than a country. Why do you expect servanthood to be cheap, to be easy? You know, if you are going to be a servant, the first thing you must learn to obey the voice of the Lord. Hear the Lord and obey his voice. And I think that's, what, that's where every soldier begins. All right, servanthood can be compared to athletics. An athletic combines many things in order to run and win. So in servanthood, I, would, I mean, I'm bringing in the soldier. 
And the second person the Paul, I mean the apostle Paul talks about is, um, is the adreti. And adreti combines many things, you know. Um, you find him running, you find him exercising, all that in preparation for the race. He or she has to work on speed, has to work on fitness, has to work on style, among many other things. You have to be fit to run. Now, some people would want to just see speed, and he says, no, it is not just about speed. You also need to be fit. And so he, he, he exercises for fitness. Some other people would say, okay, you are fit, you have a speed. What else? He says, you know what? I also need the style. It is not just running. It's not about speed. It is also the style, you know? Um, an athlete who only works on a speed and he knows the rest of requirement could not expect to win in a highly competitive environment because all the three combined makes an athlete. Now, a servant is not just one who prays and who speaks in tongues and one, no. There are a number of things. You have to train on discipline. You have to train um, on a on a ability to hear God. You have to train on ability to obey, you know. It began to rest of a situation, whether you're feeling nice or not nice, whether people are happy with you or not happy with you, whether they are clapping for you or not clapping for you, you are a servant. And you need to be trained because, as the Bible says, we must fix our eyes to the Lord. Now, the other thing is, um, you must know that um, they have to be involved, and the trees have to be involved in a comprehensive training um, and they are expected to combine training and the practice on daily basis. Now, as I welcome you to this, you know, servanthood um, season, um, I would want you to know that there are a number of combinations that the Lord will expect from us. A lot of training, you know. You'll be trained on how to handle people. Some people say, ah, you know, I served until people started talking against me. I gave up. Others say, you know, I served, and then the man of God or woman of God did not recognize my services. God expects us to go beyond there. Uh, it's a comprehensive training. To become a servant, one will be compelled to do several things, just as Apostle Paul put it. Work out your salvation with a fear and a trembling. Philippians 2, verses 12. So in the next chapter, I'll be looking at the requirement of a true servant. Have you been struggling with money-related issues? Has your financial life already gone to a crisis and you've gone to every extent to try to salvage your financial life, but all is in vain? Are you also there and you know you've been struggling with the call of God upon your life? You know that the Lord has called you to serve Him, but you've, you do not understand exactly what you ought to do. Then, I present to you two amazing books, Money Matters, The Spiritual Dimension, and Call to Serve, The Spirit of Sacrificial Servanthood. These two books have been written by Apostle Patrick Morethi Nyaga. You can get these two books by calling the numbers on your screen to order your copy now. Money Matters goes for only a thousand Kenya shillings, and Call to Serve goes for only 500 Kenya shillings only. Trust you me, these two books will be a blessing to you and to your life. The Lord bless you. Shalom.